So good morning, everybody. My name is David Andalfaro. I'm in the research division of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. We're here at the 38th annual policy conference at the Fed. And um, we're very happy to have uh, uh, Marcus Brunemeyer, who's a professor of economics at Princeton University. He's here to talk about a paper he just presented, in fact. It's called The, the I Theory of Money. That's the uh, I with a capital I. Thank you very much for joining us, Marcus. Hi, David. I was wondering the, if you'd uh, be kind enough to tell us a little bit about the question that you're pursuing in this paper. Yeah, I should say what the I stands for. The I stands for inside money or intermediation. So it's all about banking. And what the paper tries to explain how financial stability and price stability interacts. So traditionally it was viewed you can treat financial stability separately, the bank supervisors take care of financial stability, and you have the central banks then taking care of price stability. And this paper shows how these two concepts interact quite a lot. So what, what, are, what are the main findings of your research? So the main findings are that once there is a negative shock, then banks try to shrink the balance sheets. And this has two effects, one on the asset side of the balance sheet and one on the liability side of the balance sheet. On the asset side, as they sell these assets, the price of the assets go down and down and down. And this hits the banks again, so they lose on equity because the assets are worth less in times of crisis. But even equally important, it is the case that they also decline the liability side. And by declining the liability side, they create less inside money. So total money supply in the economy is actually going down. What happens if total supply is going down? The value is going up. This means each dollar is worth more. And this means, again, deflationary pressure. And the deflationary pressure then hurts the bankers again because they owe money to the public. And as the value of these dollars is going up, they owe more to the public. and this makes them even less well capitalized. So this sort of story has, it's a, it's a familiar theme, I think, in the history of economic thought. I think uh, Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory rings a bit of that. Uh, and I'm aware of other people who have written here and there about the, uh, the subject. Can you, can you elaborate on what, what your paper does a little bit different? Are there any surprising results that these other authors have missed? Or? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's indeed the case that, you know, it's related to earlier research, in particular the Fisher deflation spiral is going on, but it's also related to Friedman and Schwartz where you see that, you know, the banks are going bankrupt and because of the financial instability there's less money creation. If the Fed is not intervening, there is this deflationary pressure going on leading to the Great Depression. Uh, what we are trying to do is we try to combine the money view and the credit view in the same framework and we can distinguish between these two in, in a coherent framework. So what do I mean by a money view versus credit view? If you follow the, the money view, which follows very much what uh, Friedman and Schwartz focused on is, you try to switch off this deflationary pressure and by doing so you help the banks because they would lose out from this deflation. If you follow more the credit view, which was, among others, also pushed by Jim Tobin, then you would like to restore the total credit flow to the real economy. So you switch off not only the deflationary spiral, a la Fisher, but you also try to switch off the liquidity spiral. And what this analysis provides a framework how to, to see the interaction between the deflationary spiral and the liquidity spiral in the same uh, analysis. So imagine uh, a policymaker was armed with either the uh, Friedman and Schwartz model or the view or the or the competing view the Tobin view uh, do you think that the policymaker might uh, misjudge of how to optimally intervene in a time of crisis without your comprehensive view of, of the way these things interact yes so I think one distinguishing feature which I didn't highlight so far is that what do you here have, you have more bottleneck economic analysis where you say, as a monetary policy maker, you say, where is the bottleneck? Who, which sector is financially impaired? Mm -hmm. And I would like to do financial or monetary policy which reduces these financial impairments. So for example, it's always the financial sector which is, when, is hit by in the financial crisis. But it's also the case that there's always another sector involved in it. So if you look in Japan, for example, in 1990s, when the two lost decades started, it was the corporate sector which was very over levered. So you would like to do some monetary policy which helps more the corporate sector. Like, unlike in the US, where now it is more certain sectors in the household sector which are over 
overly indebted. And then you would like to do something which helps more the mortgage market, the housing market, in order to repair the balance sheets of the households. Let me get you right, though, here. I mean, you're, you're not suggesting, for example, that the Fed should tar explicitly target certain hard-hit sectors of the economy. You're suggesting that the policies that they under undertake naturally in a crisis, lowering the interest rate, quantitative easing, will naturally affect uh, or, in, or help the uh, most distressed sectors? They will, to some extent, naturally help yeah. the most distressed sector, but you would like to tilt it a little bit towards the sector. What would be an bound. example of a Fed policy in the present context that would, say, help the household sector? So uh, within this analysis, it would mean when the Fed is buying mortgage-backed securities, it's very much targeted towards the housing, okay. which then helps the household sector, while the corporate sector is not benefiting so much from that. Indeed, I mean, the Fed tries to, is concerned that the corporate bond market is trading at such a high level. So the present Fed policy of purchasing these mortgage-backed securities is, in fact, uh, somewhat justified by your theoretical approach here. It is to some extent justified, even though you also see there's a lot of redistribution going on towards households who don't really need it. Mm. So it's probably, to in some extent, not targeted enough. The problem is, the more you target it, the, more, the bigger the moral hazard problem becomes. Moral hazard, can you explain that? So moral hazard means that people don't behave in a prudent manner anymore. So if you know whenever something goes wrong, the Fed will jump in and help you out, then you will not behave prudently anymore. You just buy and drive up house prices and buy more expensive houses. So as a government or as a, as a Fed, you don't want to help out too much because then it will lead to the next crisis. So there's a little bit concerned. of a trade-off here, to trade off these, uh, these bad incentive effects owing to this moral hazard effect versus the uh, insurance effect, I guess. Yes. Recapitalizing this, the household sector in this case that was really quite shocked. Uh, the how price, the drop in the real estate prices, uh, these distressed uh, uh, homeowners with the mortgages that are constraining their spending. Yes. And it's a, um, Let's see, I wanted to, uh, uh, you, you speak as if uh, this is a policy that the Federal Reserve Bank uh, of the United States or indeed in general uh, central banks around the world might wish to undertake. But of course, as your discussion pointed out, uh, this seems like a natural, the idea of redistributing wealth in an economy is kind of, it's a politically sensitive issue when it comes to uh, a central bank, uh, especially the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve Bank. And this sounds like it's a job that, uh, at least in principle, is ideally suited for the fiscal authority. I mean, there's a body of elected representatives, and then the, the fiscal authority redistributes wealth all the time. I mean, this is partly what their, their job is to do. Uh, the Fed, uh, to the extent that it likes to maintain uh, independence and, and be politically detached, kind of uh, refrains from uh, overt acts of uh, redistributing wealth. Uh, do you see any... Is there some reason for why you believe, you know, uh, realistically the Fed should be doing this job as opposed to, say, elected members of Congress? So I would say, I would distinguish between stopping some redistribution from inaction versus actively redistribute, redistributing wealth. I, I don't think the Fed should get into the business of actively redistributing wealth. But it could be like in the Great Depression, by not doing anything, there will be huge redistribution. So the inaction leads to redistribution. And you want to switch off this redistribution rather than doing actively some redistribution. So the Fed is there to prevent an unintended uh, redistribution yes. of wealth that if, uh, if it was left un untended would actually have adverse macroeconomic consequences to yes. potentially adversely affect the economy as a whole. Exactly. So All it right. could be, it's not a zero-sum game. It could be that everybody is worse off if the Fed is not intervening, like in the Great Depression. Um, you alluded to in your talk uh, about the, uh, some notion of an economy uh, where if, if, if in a time of uh, tranquility, of relative tranquility, like during the great moderation that we experience, when there's the natural forces that cause turbulence have abated, that, that nevertheless the overall risk exposure to the economy measured in some way might, may nevertheless decline because private actors in the economy, banks, financial managers, whatever, might expose themselves naturally to more risk. They become more tolerant of risk mm -hmm. so that the, the overall risk in the economy might not uh, diminish. I, I found that point really interesting. I was wondering if you could 
maybe elaborate on that in a bit, if I've characterized it correctly or not? Yeah, so what we have in this analysis is that we can distinguish between two forms of risk. One is exogenous risks, risk which comes from outside because fundamentally certain projects are risky, and endogenous risk, risk which is created within the system. So it's self-generated risk. And this self-generated risk leads to redistributions as well. So the Fed should try to reduce the self-generated risk in the system. So that's essentially the role of monetary policy to reduce this amplification which is going on. Implicit in the statement you just made was the idea that left to its own devices, the uh, free market economy would generate excessive amount of, of risk. That's correct. So, and the surprising thing is what we find in our formal analysis if I make the exogenous risk smaller and smaller, the endogenous risk is not becoming smaller. So endogenous risk, the self-generated risk, is always there. It's not going away, even if I make you know, the fundamental risk go away. But why can we not rely on the private sector to generate just the right amount of risk? Surely uh, zero risk is also not desirable because there's yeah, so trade-offs. There are trade-offs and there's the phenomenon that if I reduce the fundamental risk, which I cannot get rid of, uh, it is the case that if this goes becomes smaller and smaller, the banks will level up more and more such that the endogenous risk, the self-generated risk, is still staying there. The banks are over-levering. The banks are over-levering. What is causing the banks to overexpose themselves to this type of risk? I think it's indeed important that banks take some risk, some fundamental risk, but one should limit the endogenous risk with the self-generated risk in the system. And that comes from the fact that banks don't fully internalize when they do something, it has negative repercussions on others as well. So for example, when the banks lever up and then they will be forced to delever, like shrinking their balance sheet. So if I shrink my balance sheet, I will depress the asset prices. But this also has some negative repercussions on you. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're another bank. Mm -hmm. And I don't fully, when I make my decisions, take this fully into account. So these externalities, as we talk in economics, mm -hmm. um, causes for too much leverage in the system. I see. So would this be an argument perhaps for these banks to uh, coalesce, to, to, to conglomerate and form one big bank? I mean, to some extent you see it in Canada. In Canada you have very few banks and they didn't shrink the balance sheet so dramatically. In the mm -hmm. US you have a lot of competing banking landscape and they shrink the balance sheets much more dramatically. But I would not argue there should be a collusion among the banks because it comes with severe <laughs> additional side effects. Uh, I think the side effects would be more severe than, uh, than you know, allowing them to collude. Very good, very interesting. So at the end of the day, um, what would you say uh, the, the takeaway is of your paper if you had to summarize it in two or three sentences? I think the key takeaway of the paper is essentially that before the crisis, we had three stability concepts. Financial stability, bank regulators should take care of it. Price stability, central bank should take care of it. And fiscal debt sustainability, that the government can pay back its debt. This should be part, the government should take care of it. And we thought we can treat them independently and in silos. Okay. And what this analysis shows that all these three stability concepts are highly interconnected and there has to be some coordination across these sectors. And true independence for a central bank means to be protected from the other parts because there might be some financial dominance argument where the banking sector might make it hard for the Fed to control inflation. Very good. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thanks, David.